Okay, guys, let's go ahead and continue working through this gospel. We have two left, two um, studies left in Matthew's gospel. Um, as we move on in Matthew's gospel, we'll, we come to the resurrection narrative. Each of the gospels um, present different aspects of the resurrection. The differences between the four gospels and their accounts um, are rooted in the fact that each of the four authors have different main points that they're trying to get across in their gospel. Um, so they're going to jot down events or perspectives of the resurrection that aren't false, they're true, but they're just different from one another because they're, the purpose of the gospel itself that they write has a different purpose than the other three. So we hear, see here in Matthew, we understand that. One of the things that he talks about is the prophecy. He fulfills prophecy, not just of the Old Testament, but of the New Testament. When Christ himself fulfilling the words that he had spoken. We'll see that just a few chapters before Matthew's Gospel. The fact that he's going to die and raise again. And then also Matthew presenting him as the sovereign king. Sovereign over death included which is what we see in these verses too. So Matthew has a perspective of presenting Jesus as the sovereign king over all, including death. Um, most studies of the resurrection narrative begin the resurrection story in chapter 28, verse 1. That's when most people, when teaching through Matthew, would divide the text up a little bit differently than what I'm dividing it up. Uh, the reason why I'm going, I'm starting the resurrection narrative in verse 62 of chapter 27 is because I think that um, that is critical to understanding the resurrection. It sets the stage of the resurrection. It places um, <coughs> guards in front of the tomb. Some folks, like I said, um, would handle that more about, and that would be the that would be the final component of the passion. Um, I'm not saying wrong. I'm just saying that the way that I see this is I see this as the beginning of the resurrection narrative. The fact that they're there because it sets the stage for the climactic event of the resurrection. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at verses uh, 62 through 66 and 27, in chapter 27 first, and we're going to see an attempt to stop the resurrection. In chapter 28, 1 through 10, we're going to see the resurrection itself. And then in 28, 11 through 15, we're going to see an attempt to cover up the resurrection. So, trying to stop the resurrection, the resurrection itself, and then trying to cover up the resurrection. All right, let's go ahead. We're going to read one section at a time, talk about it, and move on to the next section. So we'll look at 27, 62 through 66. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how the impostor said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest he, his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people. He has risen from the dead. Unless, I'm sorry, let me read that again. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Okay, after the day of preparation, so we're talking about events that happened on Saturday. The day of preparation would be Friday. After the day of preparation would be Saturday. So this is a Sabbath. This is not just any Sabbath. This is the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Why? Because it's Passover week. This is the most important Saturday of the year from a Sabbath perspective, right? Um, notice, though, their desire to obey the Sabbath is trumped by their desire to keep Jesus in the grave. They're throwing out all those rules that they want to follow, right, in order to keep Jesus in the grave. Notice also the group of people that we're talking about, the chief priests and the Pharisees. Chief priests has some Sadducees in there, and they're working together. This is this only the second time in Matthew's Gospel we see the chief priests and the Pharisees working together. And this is significant because they hate each other. It would be like the, the extreme liberals 
partnering with the extreme conservatives, all in the name of keeping Jesus in the tomb. They hate each other, but their hate for Jesus and desire to keep Jesus in the tomb trumps their hate for each other. So they, work to, they come together and um, they come to Pilate. Notice what they call Pilate. In verse 63. Sir. Sir was translated from the Greek word kurios, which is also translated Lord. Pilate's their Lord. Pilate's their king. It's clear that the chief priests and the Pharisees have rejected the Lord Jesus and have made the Romans their Lord. And this is confirmed by their own mouth in John 19, 15, where they say, we have no king but Caesar. It's clear that Christ, that God, is not their king. Um, so they say to their Lord Pilate, we remember how the impostor said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. The specific teaching that they're referring, we found back in Matthew 12, uh, verse 38 through 40. Um, let, me, let, me re let me remind you. 12, 38 through 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah has, was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This, he also mentions his death and resurrection in 20, chapter 26, verse 60 through 61, which we just looked at not too long ago. Um, when the two false witnesses come up, right? He, they say, he, Jesus says that you, he says, you destroy the temple and I will raise in three days. So we see Matthew um, referencing the, um, the chiefs and priests, and the, the chief priests and the Pharisees remembering what Jesus had said, right? So their concern, the chief priests and the Pharisees are concerned that the disciples then will remember this teaching and then go and steal his body from the tomb. But look at the irony. The disciples have took off. They're, they're, they're in a room hiding, shaking, scared, fearful, running away. They overestimated the disciples. So they don't, they're, 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 they're scared, they're running away, they're confused and terrified flabbergasted because nowhere in their minds, nowhere in their messianic framework did they think the Messiah would be killed. So they're still processing this, right? The, 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 the chief priests and the Pharisees think that they're not, that they're scheming to raise, to steal the body. Now, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in the possibility of the resurrection from the dead but they know the disciples and the Jewish people do. So that's why they say they prevent the disciples from stealing the body, creating some kind of a lie to then cause the Jewish, peoples to, to Jewish people to believe, and then as a result, a revolt happens. They don't believe in the resurrection, but they know that the, the Jews, the, the Jewish people do. So they're tr trying to prevent the, them from stealing the body and then lying and saying there was a resurrection. Everybody follow this. Because it's, it's, it's how the irony here is amazing. Um, if they, the disciples go steal the body, the Jewish people, and then tell the Jewish people um, a lie and tell them that, that he rose from the dead, they would lose control over the Jewish people and they would have a revolt. That's why in verse um, 64 they say, the last fraud will be worse than the first. What's the first fraud in their minds? Jesus was the Messiah. And then the last fraud in their mind would be he wrote, rose from the dead. So they can't have that. So they go to Pilate, their Lord, and say, you have... They ask them to protect the, the tomb. Pilate then responds in 65. You have a guard of soldiers, so make it as secure as you can. So they went and the, made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. So to keep Jesus in the grave, they seal it and guard it with soldiers. 
Um, so sealing the tomb probably meant that they poured wax on it in between the stone and the face of the tomb. If the stone rolls over it, they probably poured wax around the, the, on the, between the, the rock, the stone, and the face of it. Okay, that sealing of, of it. And the seal probably had um, an imprint of some kind of a Roman nature. So it was, a, it was like a, a, a sign, a signal that says that this, this was Rome's seal. Therefore communicating that Rome, don't miss this, has authority over the grave. That's pretty ironic. Because we're just about to find out that the only one who has authority over the grave is the dead one inside of it. Complete authority over it. So they stamp it to show everyone that Rome has authority over this grave. Um, not so much. Another note um, worth mentioning before we move on to the resurrection itself is the presence of the soldiers eliminates the possibility of someone actually stealing Jesus' body. They're there. The fact that they're there. And these are highly trained soldiers too. Um, the fact that they're there eliminates the possibility of somebody saying that the disciples came and stole the body. So in an attempt to prevent a hoax, look at the irony, in an attempt to prevent the hoax from happening, they inadvertently confirm the truth of the resurrection. Isn't that interesting? Look at the irony. The simple fact that they're there eliminates the possibility of disciples coming and stealing the body. So their attempt to prevent the hoax actually confirms the reality of the resurrection. Um, but I want you to see man's attempt to thwart the plans of God and keep Christ in the grave. That's the key to these verses. Man is trying to thwart God's plan and keep Christ in the grave. Not going to end well. So now in verse 28, now we see the resurrection. Um, 1 through 10, let's read those verses. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, well, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So this is the second earthquake here in a couple of days, right? Remember there was an earthquake um, back on Friday? So these two earthquakes helped to connect the death and the resurrection. There's, there's, there's events going on during the death and events going on during the resurrection that are um, similar. Therefore, connecting this and joining together um, these two events as one single event in salvation history. Um, not only did the earth shake, but the soldiers did too. Okay? The soldiers are there. They see it. They, sh they shake. And remember, if you're a Roman, if, remember that these are Roman guards, highly trained, never to fall down, could have easily been, de could, could have easily defeated any f man who's coming to take the body. But here they shake and, and, and fall down. Um, but of course, they can't stop God Himself. So, what does the angel say <clears throat> to the ladies? He says, he is not, verse 6, he is not here, for he has risen, as he said, as he said, fulfilling prof prophecy fulfillment, as he said, come see the place where he lay. So why was the stone, Christ can walk through 
walls, walk through stone. Why was the stone moved? So that they can see it. A gracious act to give them, with their own eyes, the ability to see the empty tomb. That's why the stone was rolled away, not so that Christ can leave it. It was already gone, but the, so that they can see it. Um, so when you read uh, when you when you read when you read any any this is just a good tip on when you study the Bible um, when you when you're studying a particular section of text and you see a word repeating itself it's repeating the author the Holy Spirit through the author has a point there that's why they're repeating the words um, so that the the reader doesn't miss it and if you look there's there's some words here that are reported are repeated multiple times behold see look verse 2 behold um, verse 6 see verse 7 see see verse uh, and behold verse 9 behold verse 10 see um, so I'm studying John right now so when because when I come back from um, starting I start teaching again in December and I'm teaching the Gospel of John and right now I'm looking at John the Baptist and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that, that word behold here, same applies here. It's not just see. I'm like, great. And then just kind of go about your business. There's a level of a call to believe what you see here. There's an intense call. Don't miss it. Hello, don't miss this. So within the call to see, there's a call to believe. It's not just see and say, yeah, it has no impact on me. But it's see, believe what you see. Amen? Same, is said, same, same could be said here. And that's what Matthew, the gospel writer, is making sure that his Jewish readers are, are seeing, believing, beholding, looking. Don't, don't just look at and see, um, but the call from the angel to these women, also the same. Believe. Um, it's a very strong call here. Um, so in verse, in verse 8, they take off, and upon seeing him in verse 9 and 10, the women respond by falling prostrate, um, face first at his feet, and worship him both in fear and joy. And then in verse uh, 10, Jesus, Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. And then he reiterates what the angel told them to do. And, um, but look at verse 10. He says, then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. So he's calling the group of people who abandoned him, who are up in the, in the room shaken, scared, um, his brothers, which is encouraging. Um, we see the Lord's grace poured out on them by just simply referring to them as brothers. All right, so that's the resurrection narrative. Now let's go to verses, 20, verse 11, verses 11 through 15 in chapter 28. Um, because now we're going to see um, kind of the, the ending part, the, 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 the end of this part, 20, verse 62 through 66. So verses 11 through 15 are the conclusion of verses 62 through 66 of chapter 27, okay? Where we see them trying to cover up the resurrection. Let's look at verse 11 through 15. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. So again, these are the conclusion to the previous um, verses that we looked at, 62 through 66 of chapter 27. As we see the enemies of God continuing to stand against God and the truth of the resurrection. So, while they were going, who's the they in verse 11? Context. While they were going, who's the they? Say it again. The women. That's the they. So as the women, this is important, as the women are running to tell the disciples, there's some joy and some fear there because their, their mind's blown. 
At the same time, now the soldiers are running out of horrific panic to tell the chief priests. So while at the same time this is going on, now when the guards get to the chief priests, they don't lie to the chief priests. What do they tell the chief priests? All that had taken place. So they are bearing witness to the truth of the angel, the empty tomb. They go to the chief priests and they tell the truth. They, they are bearing witness with their own mouth what, what actually happened. Now the chief priests take this testimony and scheme to cover up by creating lies. Again, look at the irony. The reason the chief priest sent the guards to the tomb in the first place was to guard against lies. They sent them there to prevent people from lying and saying that the disciples came and stole the body. So they were there to stop a lie and now they are actually creating the lie. Fabricating, creating this fabrication. Um, notice the bribe of the chief priest to offer the guards parallels the same bribe that they offered Judas. So for Judas, they bribed him to get information. For the Roman soldiers, they bribed them to suppress information. Same thing, same idea, same bribery going on. Um, so what's, the, what, what's their lie? What do they say? Tell people that his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Any logical person could listen to this and ask a couple of questions. Well, any logical person who was interested in seeking the truth could listen to this, the disciples stole, stole him away, and um, know that there's something fishy about this story. It's because there's a couple of things that were operating here. If you were sleeping, because that's what they're saying they were, right? First of all, how were you sleeping? Because the earth shook, there's an earthquake, and this, we're talking about a massive stone being rolled away. How are you missing that if you're sleeping, right? Okay, let's say you're a deep sleeper. Let's say you're a deep sleeper, right? How do you know it was his disciples? If you were sleeping, how could you even say, oh, his, his, his disciples came and stole him away? You were sleeping. So you see, any, and anybody who's seeking truth and could challenge that story, would ask those two questions and be like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. You're lying. That's not the truth. Right? And there was no like light. We didn't have to have a light shining down on them. And, you know. But it's just, I mean, just launch it. Just think about it, guys. And what, so if you think about that then, what does that do? That creates, strengthens, deepens our faith in the reality that this is in fact true. Okay? Makes our knees, strengthens our knees, gets us to get firm in the, in the reality that this is, in, this is fact. Because any logical person would say, well, if you, were, if you were sleeping, how'd you not hear the earthquake in the stone? Well, I'm a deep sleeper. Well, if you're a deep sleeper, then how'd you know that it was the disciples or anybody? Lies. Liar. <sighs> Notice that they're in their story. The chief priests and the Pharisees here remove the supernatural. They remove the angel, remove the earthquake, and they only bring it to um, he was stolen by the um, disciples, which is a lie. Now, because Pilate, I told you this before, these Roman soldiers, if they would have fallen asleep on the job, then they would have been killed by Pilate. So now they're thinking, put yourself in the Roman soldier's shoes. I don't want to die. How can I not die? And they're going to give me money. So the option is, I'll be able to get money, and they're going to tell suffice Pilate and make sure Pilate doesn't kill me. I'm going to go this route. Yeah, I'm going to go this route. I'll take the money, know that they'll take care of Pilate, and then I'll be okay. So the bribe is easy. And Matthew says that the bribe, or the lie... Look at the end of that. He says that the lie um, in this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. 
So while Matthew was penning this gospel, there are still people who are saying that his disciples stole his body from the grave. Again, not true. So their purpose was to prevent a lie, right? And end up being the ones who create the lie. Amen? All right, let's read these verses one last time. Verse 62 of 27. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last row will be worse than the first. Pause this. The disciples aren't even thinking about going to steal in their body. They ran away. They're scared. They're in, in the, the room shaken. <clears throat> Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Sealing the stone has the Roman imprint showing that Rome has authority over this grave. But the dead person inside of it is actually the one who has the authority over the grave. Chapter 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. They went to see. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come see the place he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met, met them and said greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there you will see me. Eight times. And then verse 11. While they were going, behold, there's another one, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Father God in heaven, Lord, we come. I'm thankful for the gift of faith and thankful for the Holy Spirit whose job it is to lead us into truth, to grow us in truth and to exalt Christ. Um, Lord, we recognize the truth here. <clears throat> that the, the soldiers were not sleeping. Um, we also recognize the beauty of asking these questions of if they were sleeping, how did they not hear it? And if they were in deep sleep, how did they know that it was the disciples that stole the body? And so we see, Lord, that those quest, the value of thinking through that. And so I ask, uh, Lord, that um, the seeds that were sown this morning um, fall on hearts in this room, um, Lord, and through the video um, that may produce 30, 60, and 100 fold fruit, fruit for your glory, Lord. That um, the reality of these, these truths um, help to strengthen our faith in you and cause us to submit to your word, even in the face of opposition from, from people who are professed enemies and even those who maybe even profess to be a Christ follower but are in opposition to your word. Uh, Lord, we ask for grace, um, like we mentioned earlier, um, so that you may be glorified. We love and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.